morning our study takes us back to the third chapter of the book of Ephesians and we want to uh, bring some kind of conclusion to the second prayer that we read in the book of Ephesians and next week we will talk about the, the doxology that he gives us at the close of chapter 3. What appears in this book in chapters 1, 2, and 3, what appears to be two different <laughs> prayers, I believe, actually tied together. In some respects, can be looked at as simply one prayer. In fact, this, this prayer, in many respects, becomes the framework upon which Paul builds his theology and his thoughts and his ideas. If you would turn back a page and looking at chapter 1, beginning at verse 15, we will notice a common phrase, depending on your translation. Each time he prays, he begins with the phrase, for this reason. Um, in, in chapter 1, verse 15, it says, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith, in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all of the saints. <clears throat> he begins with that phrase, for this reason. He has just stated in chapter 1 why he was going to pray for these believers. They had been included in Christ when they heard of the truth, verse 13 teaches us. They became Christians. And they received the Holy Spirit. And because this was a true principle, because this was a basic idea, Paul simply asked God to help them to grow and to mature in their Christian lives. For each request in these prayers, as found in chapter 1 as well as chapter 3, Paul would then explain why he made the request. Now I want us to look at a summary of this because as we get ready to leave chapter 3, I want us to be able to tie in together these two prayers and be able to answer the question, what is the request and why is the request made? What's the request? What's the reason for the request? And be able to tie this together as we make our way out of chapter 3. Let's look at request number 1. Go back to chapter number 1. I just read verse 15. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, which exists among you and your love for all of the saints. Verse 16. Do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. Here we go with quest, request number one. Somebody say request number one. Request number one. Here it is, verse 17. <laughs> that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, this glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why? Why is this a request? Well, Paul simply wants his readers, he wants the saints at Ephesus to be able to know God better. To be able to know God better. That they receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that will enable them to know God better. As we move out of verse 17, go in verse 18, his request number two in his prayer. Request number two. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. For what reason? In order that you may know something. I want the eyes of your heart to be enlightened, that you may know something. What? 
Know three things in particular. Know the hope to which he has called you. Number two, know the riches of his glorious inheritance that's in the saints. And know number three, the, incom the incomparable great power for us who believe. What's request number one? Oh, he has called us. Request number one is that the saints will be given the spirit of wisdom and revelation. What's request number one? Spirit of wisdom and revelation. All right, all right. Can we add two more to those seven that just spoke? What's request number one? Why so that did he want God to give to them a spirit of wisdom and revelation? So that we may know him better. So that we know God better. Can we pray that today? Yes, that's relevant for us today. And so that's included in our prayers and our bulletins. And we want you to pray this personally for yourselves and for others, other believers. We include in our prayer for believers that they too would be able, that God would give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation for what reason? So that they can know God better. What is request number two? That the eyes of their heart may be enlightened. In order that they may know what? Number one. The hope to which he has called them. Number two, that they may know what? The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. In the saints. And that they may know, number three, the exceeding great power, great power for us who believe. The exceeding great power for us who believe. Now, saints, now, this is, this is of utmost importance. One of the reasons why individuals in the church have such problems with sin is because of what they don't know. One of the reasons why we come to God with a beggary attitude, please God do this, please God do this, I need this, I need that, is because of what they don't know. One of the reasons that 90% of our prayers is consumed with asking God for material stuff is because of what we don't know. Paul wants his readers, he wants his congregation to know something, to understand who they are in Christ, what they have in Christ, so that when temptations come, they understand who they are, they understand who is living within them, what kind of power that they have. So it's not just a matter of just saying no and then wrestling with the flesh, and praying that hope that I will get victory over this this time. There is a power that is within us. Paul is going to pray the second prayer. So I want us to understand what is request number one is that the Father would give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation. I pray today that we as a congregation would ask God for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why? Because I want to know you better, Lord. I want to know you better. I also pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened so that all of us in this room may know what is the hope to which God has called us, that all of us in this room would know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and the exceeding great power for us who believe. Now, beginning in chapter 3, Paul gives us part 2 as he continues, I believe, this thought, this, this prayerful thought. And he begins once again in, in verse number 1, chapter 3, for this reason. But he immediately decided, as the Holy Spirit leads him, he gives his personal ministry testimony, verses 2 through 13. And he gives us his calling into the ministry and specifically what God has called him to do. He reveals to us this mystery as we read in verse 6. 
that through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together in one body, and share together in the promise of Christ Jesus. Because of what God has done for all of us, we have a wonderful foundation for prayer. Paul says in verse 12, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. And then beginning again in verse 14, Paul is ready to return again to his prayer that he began in verse number 1. He once again establishes the, uh, 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 this thought in the minds of his readers by saying and repeating, for this reason, these believers were living proof that Gentiles could be saved. They, along with Paul and his fellow Jews, are included in Christ. They have received the Holy Spirit. Now Paul completes his prayer by making two additional requests. Building upon what he has already asked God for on behalf of his believers, Paul prays. Here's the third request. Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Chapter 3. Chapter 3. He says in verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner being, or the inner man, the inner being. For what reason? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray, Paul says, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power. Power, Greek word, dunamis, power, the ability to break up stuff. Power through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that dwells where? In the inner man. For what reason? Verse 17. So that Christ may dwell. This word dwell in the Greek means to be able to make one self at home. To dwell permanently. To be able to go through whatever area that needs to be cleaned up and cleaned up. To throw out whatever needs to be thrown out. That Christ may dwell in your heart. But Christ dwells in your heart through what? Through faith. It's the ability to trust God. It's the ability to have confidence in God's word that he's able to dwell in your heart. Christ living in us, Christ dwelling in us is made possible by us acting in faith. If there's no trusting in his word, if there's no confidence in his testimony, then there is no Christ dwelling in your heart. So the first request is that he would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation. For what reason? So that I might know God better. Request number two is that the eyes of my heart would be enlightened. For what reason? So that I can know some things. I need to know three things. I need to know the hope to which he has called me. I need to know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And the exceeding great power for us who believe. Then request number three that takes up into chapter three. Request number three is that I may be strengthened according to God's riches. I may be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit that lives in my inner being. For what reason? So that Christ may dwell. The dwelling of Christ is dependent upon the power that lives within us. If there's no power from the Spirit living within us, there is no Christ dwelling in us. For what reason? So that Christ may dwell in your heart's house through faith. And then request number four. Request number four. Paul says, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints, to be able to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses 
knowledge. Why? What's the reason? That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That you may be filled with to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now when we study this prayer in this fashion, it flows from chapter 1 to chapter 3. Four main requests. Four main requests. Four, four different aspects of this man's prayer for the saints. We already established last week, he didn't ask for no material stuff. He didn't ask for healing. He didn't ask for deliverance. He didn't ask them to pray and ask God that he may be delivered out of bondage. He's praying for their spiritual health and for their spiritual strength. The point that we made last week is we put too much emphasis upon the material in our prayer life. And for the saints, we need to be praying for the spiritual. Now let's go over this again. There are four requests. I want you, I want you to leave with these four requests without you having to look at your notes. Plant this in your spirit. Plant get this in your spirit. Walk with this next week and pray this for yourself and pray this for others. What's request number one? That you would get that you will be given the spirit of wisdom and revelation. For what reason? To know God better. Now, I want to know God better. Anybody here want to know God better? Yes. To know God better, we need a spirit of wisdom and revelation. What's request number two? The eyes of our heart may be enlightened. So that I may know three things. I may know three things. I may know three things. What's the first thing I want to know? The hope of his calling. What's the second thing I want to know? The riches of the glorious inheritance in the saints. Well, some translations say in the saints, but some say of the saints. His, his, his inheritance. What's the third thing I, Paul wants us to know? Toward us who believe that we would know the great power that we have. Request number three. That we will be strengthened with power in the inner man through the Holy Spirit. So that, here's reason number three, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So Christ may dwell in your heart. So Christ may live permanently within our hearts through faith. That Christ may live permanently and be at home permanently through faith. And then request number four is that we will be rooted, grounded in love. We will have power together with all the saints to be able to grasp, get a firm hold of how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. To know that the love of Christ does not make sense to the common mind. That we can learn all dimensions of the love of Christ. Understand, if you understand as, more, as much as the Bible teaches us regarding the love of Christ, you will never be insecure. Amen. It will be hard for you to be discouraged. If I understand all of the dimensions of Christ's love, we read as a matter of fact that his love sent him to the cross. We just lip service say, yeah, I praise God he went to the cross. It was a love that drove him to the cross. And Paul is saying, I want my readers, I want the saints to understand the depth of that kind of love. The height of that kind of love. And if they understand that, no matter what comes up in the city of Ephesus, no matter what the temple Diana throw at them, 
No matter what Judaism may say, or whatever the Jews from Jerusalem may do, if they understand the love of Christ, they will be able to stand. He prays these four requests. He prays these specific. He gets very pragmatic here. More intense. We know he's intense in the second prayer because he's on his knees. He's kneeling. He prays. He is very serious about the believers knowing this. That the believers would be strengthened in their inner being. This eternal power. This power. And we see this power in chapter 1 verse 20. Go back to chapter 1, verse 20. We see this power in verse 20 where it says, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. This power that, that, that Paul is talking about is the power that raised up Christ and seated Christ on the right hand side of, of the Father. He wants the saints to really know this power. This was also the power that God had given the apostles and other selected Christians in the early days of the church to work mighty miracles in order to bear witness to the fact that the gospel was true. However, Paul was also referring to this eternal power and strength that was released in our hearts, we have the same power that raised up Christ from the dead and seated him on the right hand side of the Father. That same power resides on our in our inner being. Now, this power is rooted in two sources. The first comes when we have assurance of our salvation through faith. Power is experienced when we truly know and understand and comprehend how secure our position is in Christ. In this sense, the power is both psychological and emotional. It's strength that comes from being secure in our position in Christ. The second source of this eternal power relates to God's dwelling spirit, indwelling spirit. Jesus promised us in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 if you recall, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witness. Power is related to knowledge and truth. The power of God's spirit is released in our lives through our interaction with both the written word, scripture and the living word which is Jesus Christ. This leads to the specific reasons for Paul's request that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Jesus Christ was no longer visible when Paul wrote these writings to these saints. Nevertheless, he was alive. And through the Spirit, he was living in their hearts. And to accept this reality requires faith. Jesus is not physically here on this earth. And for us to accept that, it must be done through faith. To be strong, faith must be based on two facts. Even though these facts reflect invisible realities, the writer of Hebrews states in Hebrews 11 and 1, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. The apostles and many other New Testament Christians, they saw Christ. They walked with him. They, they touched him. They were able to live with him for brief periods of time. They saw him die. And more importantly, they saw the undeniable evidence that he had been risen from the dead. They heard him speak. They touched him in the side. They saw him eat. They heard him talk of his return. And then they stood there and saw him ascend into heaven. These Ephesian Christians could only respond to what they heard about Christ. True, though in the early days of the church, God did bear witness to the message of Christ 
and salvation by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. But these Ephesians saw limited amount of these kinds of miracles. And because the fact of Jesus was no longer visible to their eyes, the, tem the temptation in the midst of persecution, in the midst of difficulties, the temptation to grow weary, the temptation to waver spiritually was available. So Paul prayed that the Ephesians would have an inner strength through the word of God because of a relationship with the living Christ and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit that they would keep on believing and keep on trusting in the living Christ. Which pointed us to request number four was that these saints would be able through this power to grab a hold of the love of Christ. To understand the full dimensions of Christ's love is a supernatural process. Human beings cannot understand that love apart from divine help and power. All of the facts in the world can't help us truly understand why one would give his life. In fact, Christ's love, the word says, surpasses knowledge. You can know all the facts in the Bible about his love, but God wants us to know it experimentally. He wants us to experiment. He wants us to experience, rather, how wide his love is, how long his love is, how high his love is, how deep his love is. Yet even then, we will never reach the full depths of the love of Christ. Paul prayed that you and I would be rooted and established in this love, that we may have power together with all of the saints to be able to grasp the full dimensions of Christ's love. God has placed us in the body of Christ. We need each other. <clears throat> We're to love one another the way Christ loved us. Apart from the rest of the saints, we will never experience the fuller dimensions of Christ's love. We need each member in the body of Christ. We can only get to those depths with other believers. Amen. This is why he asks us to experience this with all of the saints. You are not going to reach it by yourself. Right. You can only get to those depths with other believers. And that's why we have to encourage one another. We have to encourage one another while the day is today. And then that fourth reason that you know the love is that you may be filled with the fullness of God. To be filled with God's fullness means being filled with the knowledge of God. And being filled with His Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit means that you are fully surrendered to His control. You are under the control of the Spirit. The more you and I die to ourselves, the more Christ is reflective in our thought life, in our, in our walk, in our conduct. You recall to the Colossians, Paul described the mystery as Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. He went on to say, in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ. He explained that they were dead in sin, but God made them alive in Christ. And he added in the third chapter, verse number four, that Christ was their life. Jesus described this life that the Spirit would give as streams of living water that flow continuously. John chapter 7, verse 37 and 39. Getting to know God better. Experiencing his fullness is similar to what God intended to happen in a marriage. This is why a Christian marriage reflects the relationship of the church and God. In fact, in Ephesians 5, Paul is going to use our human relationship 
with Christ as Christians to illustrate the husband-wife relationship. Many of us can remember those <coughs> moments when we thought we were in love because of our emotional reactions. We now call that infatuation. This kind of feeling is not wrong, nor is it necessarily something separate from true love. But this kind of love is not the basis upon which enduring marriages exist or build. Married life is not the continuous series of emotional highs. True love helps us to endure the difficult times as well as the happy times. It does what's right when we would rather not do it. The most complete definition of love, I believe, is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. This is the kind of stuff quality marriages are made of. The kind of love that endures and grows deeper. Fortunately, some Christians have a relationship with God that's built more on infatuation than true love. This is why many seek for an emotional high. We want an emotional worship service. We want an emotional preaching service. We want something that will touch my emotions because I am infatuated with Christ, not in love with Christ. I believe this is a selfish approach to God. And Christians are always asking, always begging, always wanting, always desiring more and more from God. Give me more of Jesus, more of the Holy Spirit, more stuff, more this, more that. This is what I want. This is what I want. I claim it. I name it. I demand it. I want it. Give it to me. Give it to me. Now, I take it. I'm taking it back. I take back what belongs to me. This consumes most of all of They want God to make them rich. Heal them of all their diseases. Give them special gifts. Make them special people. Make them happy. Make them successful. Does God want to bless us? Yes, he wants to bless us. But he doesn't want to make us selfish. He want to make us dependent upon him. He want to make us reflections of him. When Paul prayed that these Christians may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. He wasn't speaking of some ecstatic emotional feeling that would only bring an emotional charge. It's true that this kind of knowledge will touch our emotions as well as our intellect when we think about of this kind of love, when you think about a God who would give us all this, yes, we are touched emotionally. And that is what leads to true worship. That is what leads to worshiping God. Not only with our heads, but also with our hearts. However, God designed the process of getting to know Him that should be ongoing and based on His will, His word, and not our pleasures. This is what God desires for us in this prayer. Let's go through our outline. We're going to start here. With, we have completed what we finished last week. Prayer. Let it be with me. Prayer should be offered with reverence and submissive intimacy before God. That's what we read in verse number 14. Chapter 3. Chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 14. Paul said, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father. All right, uh, number C. Read together. For prayer should be made in light of our new standing as children in God's forever family. Verse 15, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Point D, read together please. Prayer, prayer should bring us before the Father on the basis of his grace. Verse 16, that he would grant you. His grace is a synonymous with the word what in that verse? We will this last week. It's synonymous with what word in that verse? Grant. 
grant, 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 grant that he would grant you, that he would grace you, he would give grace to you. That's what that word grant is synonymous with in the Greek. It's grace. All right, let's move on. Point E, read together. So he says in verse 16 that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. That his grace given to you would be in relationship to the riches of his glory. According to the riches. Now notice, it doesn't say out of his riches, but according to his riches. Now I can give you out of what I got, or I can give you according to what I got. Anybody know the difference? Here's an example. Here's an example. I want my money back. I'm gonna give out of. I give out of. I'm gonna give to you. I give out of. I give out of. But that's not. That's that's a very limited amount. Now I can give her according which. I might well give it to her anyway. Yeah. She's going to get it. I'm going to give you according to what I have. I give you all. So, which would you rather have? According to or out of? According to his riches. You got that, Sister Taylor? So, 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 now, so now Paul says here, look at what Paul said. Paul says, that he's praying that, 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 that he would grant you, and there's our word grace, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. According to, I want it all. Anybody with me? Amen. According to the riches of his glory. Okay, move on, devil. Here's one, two. To make Christ at home in your hearts, you need power through God's Spirit in the inner man. Look at, look at the latter part of verse 16. According to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man. We're not talking about no little power. We're talking about the, the power of a God who called worlds into existence. Yes. We're talking about a God who worked through Jesus, who healed the sick who raised the dead. That kind of power, according to his riches, that kind of power lives within us, the believers. You tell me that kind of power can't bring what we need in our lives? Paul says, I want you to know this. I want you to know this. So you won't be at home on your stool of self-pity crying and wondering what am I going to do what I'm going to do what am I going to do I don't know what I'm going to do instead of you telling yourself I'm trusting in God because there's a power that I have living on the inside of me that God works according let's move on the word power here is from the word dunamis, which means power, might, strength, force it speaks of inherent ability that carries the potential to perform or accomplish a task thanks we need the power of the Holy Spirit because all, because we all face problems that are beyond our power to resolve. I need y'all to read that. Read that together. Read that. We need the power of the Spirit because we all face problems that are beyond our power to resolve. Is there anyone in here that's not in, <clears throat> that's not there? We all, all of us. Heard somebody say that's including you. We all need the power of the Spirit because we all face problems that are beyond our power to resolve. Now, I'm not saying that we don't try to resolve them. 
But most of we haven't gotten to the point yet where we are not still trying to put our hand in there and trying to make it work, even though we don't put our hand as far as we used to. Amen. 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 Through experience, we learn, we're learning that we, I better start trusting God. Amen. We used to put the whole hand in there and, and get a hold of it and try to make it work, massage it, and, and change the form. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Amen. Call everybody, contact everybody. Plead our case, look sad. <laughs> Talking on the phone like we're crying. So we're like, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Get it on. Get people self pity. Amen. 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 And we've learned that after we've done all of that, we had to pray and trust God. Amen. And here you are, 17 years later, still trying to learn that lesson. That God is the one who enables us and blesses us. Amen? Amen. So Paul was praying this that the saints would know. According to his grace, according to the riches of his glory. That they would be strengthened with the power of his spirit in the inner man. Because we have issues that we cannot resolve. The letter B says, we need the power of the spirit because... We never outgrow our need for his strength. Amen. Never grow, never outgrow Amen. the need for his strength. Not, not our strength plus his strength, his strength alone. Amen. He's not the co-pilot. He's the pilot. The sea. All the instrumentation. He's the plane. He's all that's in all. Let us see. We need the power of the Spirit because God changes our outward behavior by dealing with the inner person. He changes the outward behavior by dealing with the inner person. In order for outward behavior to be dealt with on a permanent basis, the inner person must be dealt with. You can call yourself stopping certain outward habits on your own. But believe me, other habits will be created. We cannot legislate police brutality in America. Whether it's against black men, White men, period. Black Lives Matter can change the way people think. Mm -hmm. Black folks being encouraged not to go to work on a certain day, not to buy stuff on a certain day. That's not going to change nothing. Are we, are we to be concerned with what's happening in our nation? Yes, we are to be concerned. Are we to be prayerful more than ever? We are to be prayerful. To be cautious. To be alert and to be aware of our surroundings. But brothers and sisters, the only thing that's going to change this hatred is going to be the change in somebody's heart. Amen. The heart. It doesn't matter who's in the White House, whether it's a woman or whether it's a man, a Democrat or Republican. They both need Jesus. Amen. He is the only one who can change hatred to love. He's the only one who can sustain that kind of love. All of us in here, before we got saved, we had some issues. And the only thing that could change those issues and still change those issues is the power of God. Amen. We didn't love like we used to. Amen. Oh, come on here. Come on here. It's only by the power of God. We need that power. We need the power of the Spirit because God changes. God changes. Say God changes. God changes, God changes our outward behavior by dealing with the inner person. If we want the outward behavior of individuals to change, we got to pray that they come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Point number three. To make Christ at home in your heart, you need faith. This is what he said in the first part of verse 17. For what reason? So that Christ may dwell where? In your hearts. How? Through faith. Give me point A. Christ comes to be at home in our hearts as we learn to live by faith. As we learn to live by faith. 
to live by faith. Daily action, living by faith. Look at what this word dwell. It comes from those two Greek words. And read and read what it means. To what? To be at home. Come on, I need everybody. Everybody. To what? To be at home. To, to dwell, dwell at home. Now what the Cato means? It means down. So Cato added to what that word that okay means to really be at home. To settle down and to be at home. To really be at home. But Christ would have the liberty to go into every area of our, of our lives. Our thought life. To really be at home. Sometimes you invite people over and you say, be at home. Please be at home. I learned my lesson years ago. And she say, Pastor, come over. And every time I come over to my house, I say, Pastor, just be at home. Be at home. Be at home. Well, first thing I do when I go home, I go to the refrigerator. Oh, you, you plead with me to be at home, so I'm going to my refrigerator. I want to make myself at home, I go to the refrigerator, open it up. Then they realize there was something in there that shouldn't have been in there. Oh, my God, open up the refrigerator. Open up the refrigerator. You say, be at home. We want Christ to be at home, to be able to settle down and go into our thought life and pull out what needs to be pulled out in our thought life, to be pulled out what's in our emotional life. God, have your way in my life. That which needs to be pulled out, I want it to be pulled out, eradicated, I want it to be dealt with. I want Christ to have that kind of liberty. Give me point number four, Deborah. To make Christ at home in your hearts, you must be rooted and grounded in love. Let's look at this word rooted. It comes from a word Rizu. Rizu. Which means what? Can I get can I get somebody to read beside my wife? Which means what? To cause to take root. To become firmly rooted in all this. Paul prays that the saints would be rooted in love. Now, now Paul seldom used mixed metaf metaphors. He got two metaphors here. He got one that's dealing with agriculture, mm -hmm. and then he got one that's dealing with architecture. Mixed metaphors to give us an understanding of how he wants the subject of love to be within us. He wanted to be rooted. He wants to be rooted in love. He wants us to be firmly rooted and fixed in love. If we we're firmly rooted and fixed in love, we would never believe that God is against us. Amen. Amen. If we understand we got brothers and sisters in Christ, and if we're rooted and fixed in that love, we would never believe that they that they don't like us. They don't like me over there. We wouldn't allow our emotions to get crazy and run away with stuff if we're rooted and grounded in the love that God has placed in our life. Amen. What does this word grounded mean? There is a Greek word that it comes from, and it means what, saints? To, to make a basis for, to, to build, build upon the foundation, to build, to be founded, to be grounded. To be grounded. He says in that 17th verse, somebody's phone is ringing, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted, firmly fixed, that you would be rooted and grounded, having a foundation upon which to build, that you would be rooted and grounded in what? In love. Point five, being built on this love, we must have God's power to lay hold of Christ with all of the saints. So he says in verse 18 that we may be able to comprehend with all of the saints, not just you by yourself, but with all of the saints, what is the breadth, what is the, the length, the height. He gives you dimensions. Now notice, notice some of these words here. That we may be able means to have strength. The word comprehend in our text 
It means an intense, it's a, it is an intense verb. The word comprehend means to seize, to grasp for your own, to grab a hold of, to lay hold on, to grab for yourself. That you may be able, he says in that verse 18, is anybody here with me? Mm -hmm. That you may be able to grab for yourself, comprehend with all the saints, what is the dimensions of this love? It brings me to point, uh, point C. Comprehending Christ's love must happen in a community. Comprehending Christ's love must happen in the community. We as a church together, we must be growing together. There's not enough for just one or two growing. All of us should be praying that all of us is growing together as a community with all of the saints. This has a reference to all believers. And we should grow to understand the comprehensions. And he gives us, he talks about the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of his love. Now I have to ask the question, what is the breadth? What is the length? What is the height? What is the depth of his love? Let's look at the first one. What is the breadth of his love? How broad is his love? Well, I think the answer is found in verse number 14. It's broad enough to take both Jews and Gentiles and make them one. It's broad enough to bring black and whites together and make them one. Amen. It's broad enough to bring all of the nations, all of the races, and put them together in Christ and make them one. To break down, the Bible says, this middle wall of petition and abolish enmity and make one new man according, reconciling Jew and Gentile unto God. It's just that broad. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 7, verse number 9. I believe it's on the screen. Read with me. Is it on the screen? Is Revelation? No. Do you have Revelation on the screen, though? There it is. Let's read. Can you put me handle that? Let me handle that, baby. Yeah, because you, you read and study. I want to take this. Okay. Y'all yeah, read with me. Read, read. After this, I looked. And there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were robed in white with palm branches in their hands. One thing you want to notice from here, uh, John the Revelator said he saw a vast multitude. Now, now, now understand this, individuals in heaven are just not coming from the United States. He saw a vast multitude, a number that cannot be numbered. And he saw them from every nation. Iran. There's some folks from Iran saved. Love the Lord. Love God. Russia. Cuba. Am I, am I talking to somebody? Amen. Somebody from the state of Connecticut. <laughs> a few from the state of Georgia. Am I talking about? They said every somebody say every nation. Try Zulu, try Zulu, try. Every nation. See this word every should go every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, which no one could number. God got a number nobody can number. The highest you can count. God. So don't think that it stops and ends with us. Yes. It's way beyond us, saints. Yes. And they were robed in white with palm branches in their yes. hands. That's how broad it is. Yes. Somebody say, thank God for the broadness of his love. Okay, now, now, what is the length of his love? The length is from eternity in the past and it reaches into eternity future. How long is it? Are you with me? Amen. It's from eternity in the past, and it reaches into eternity future. It goes back as far as you can remember, and it goes as far as you can think. Let's read some scripture. Read, 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 read. We're already studying the book, but read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. 
For he chose us in him. When? Before the foundation of the world. When did he choose us? Before the foundation of the world. When were you chosen? Before the foundation of the world. To what? To, to be, be holy, holy and blameless in his sight. Now don't think you, you gotta you can make up in your own way how you're supposed to be now you are a Christian. If he chose us before the foundation of the world, before Genesis 1 and 1, and he chose us, he had the purpose to choose us, and he wanted us to be what? Holy and blameless in his sight. Are you with me, saints? Amen. Let's read Ephesians 2 and 7. Read. So that in the coming ages. In the what ages? In the coming ages. In the what ages? In the coming ages. Stop. Stop right there. Before the foundation points to when? The past. The past. Thank you. The coming ages uh, uh, points to what? Don't that, don't that support my, my, my point? Amen. The link is from eternity in the past and it reaches into eternity future. Read 2 and 7. So that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. How broad is it? Somebody tell me, how broad is it? How broad is his love? No, 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 no. How broad? Broad enough to encompass all nations, all tribes, all people, everybody. What's the length of his love? Now we got now we got one more, don't we? Let's talk about let's talk about the height. What's the height of God's love? Height enough. It's high enough to bless us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly place. It's high enough to reach heaven. It's high enough to bless us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That's back in love with scripture. What does Ephesians 1 and 3 say? Read please. Praise God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has blessed us in Christ. Stop, 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 stop. Who what? Has blessed us. Who what? Has blessed us. Has. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Has. This is what you already got. Sister Gilbert. Who has blessed us. Where? In Christ. In Christ. With what? Every spiritual blessing in the heavens. Now, 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 the reason why that's that's not as appealing to us is because we can't necessarily touch it. <laughs> we, we can't necessarily smell it, taste it. It's, it's, it's not tangible to us in, in, in some regard. But what we have to understand, and this is why Paul wants our eyes to be open, you can see the importance of spiritual blessings versus material blessings. Right. Praise God and our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every what? <laughs> spiritual blessing <laughs> where? In the heavens. In the heavens. Now I mean, I got one more question I gotta answer. How deep is his love? How deep is this love? Come on, read with me, saints. The depth of his love calls him to be the glory of heaven. Stop, 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 stop. Now we're going to have to settle in. Settle in. See la. How deep is his love? Read it again. The depth of his love calls him to be the glory of heaven and his exalted position there and come away to his earth to be born as a baby. It moved him to go extreme suffering of his cross where he who knew no sin was made sin for us. That's how deep. That's how deep. How deep. What is the breath of his love? How broad is his love? It's broad enough to include what is the length of his love? What is the height of his love? The height of his love is that he reaches all the way to heaven. And what's the depth of his love? Believe that your heaven come down here 
Amen. Amen. Born as a baby. There you go, my brother. The height is heaven, the depth is earth. Paul says, our last point here in verse number 18. Because oh, thou may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and to be able to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Knowing Christ's love is a never-ending process because it's unknowable. You can't come to the end of knowing about God's love. Knowing Christ's love results in spiritual maturity that will be filled up to the fullness of God. And then comprehending, comprehending Christ's love does not come naturally, but it's something that's to be done supernaturally, something that's to be done only by God. Paul says, I pray this. This is what he prayed for the saints. And we had four requests. There were four requests that Paul prayed in prayer number one and prayer number two. Anybody remember request number one? Why did he want them to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation? That they would know God better. What was request number two? For what, for what reason? Three, three of them. What was the three reasons? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Number two. Number three. Number three. Number three. Number three. Exceeding, Exceeding greatness of this power. What was the question? Number three. To strengthen with power in the man. For what reason? So that Christ could dwell in their hearts. What was request number four? They would be rooted and grounded in love. Why? Okay, uh, 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 since you're talking to me, you don't want to talk to me, talk back to you. You're not going to have a conversation. <laughs> Number four was that they would be rooted and grounded. Mm -hmm. Somebody tell me, being rooted means what? Anybody? Thank you, sister. Uh, thank you. Somebody was listening to me when we went over that. To be rooted means what? To be fixed, to be firmly established in this love. And that they would be able to comprehend. What do we say to be able to comprehend means? Sister Maddie, comprehend? To be able to comprehend? Uh-huh. It means... To be able to comprehend. What, what, yeah, yeah, but what does that word comprehend mean? No, 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 that you would have a personal understanding, a personal knowledge of what this love is all about. That's what that word. That's why we got to understand what word means. This was it. He wants you to take a hold of it, to grasp it. The word comprehend go go beyond just having a mere understanding. That you take a hold of it. It becomes yours personally. Next week I'm going to finish with yes, verse number twenty. Because there's so much in verse number 20. This is called the doxology of Paul's prayer. I just want to read it. I want to spend a whole lesson on just verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. That ends Paul's second prayer.